And it's very, very rare for uh, any black creator to break through. I still have a measuring stick. No matter what I've done, you can look at the accolades and I'm still having to do things at another level, at another notch. All right, Avery, we're back here with Gen C. Happy Friday. Good to see TGIF. you. <laughs> TGIF. Um, we're going to make this quick and go straight into our interview. We have uh, an amazing guest. We've been wanting to get Micah on the show for a little bit here. Micah Johnson, creator of Aku, digital artist, ex-MLB Major League Baseball player. Micah's going to come and tell us all about his journey. He recently was at the All-Star Game. Very excited to hear about the activation that he did there. Micah, first off, well, just, just to give our audience, what is your like two-minute backstory? All right, so two minutes. Um, you know, former Major League Baseball player, retired in 2018. Uh, pursued art full time after that. Uh, really struggled to sell any art after I retired. Took the jersey off. It was no longer cool that uh, I was a baseball player painter anymore. Uh, fell in love or discovered crypto art in late 2019. Minted my first piece in February of 2020. Um, fell in love with what it uh, crypto art represented, and that was that I could now have uh, autonomy over the way I release my work and my collectors uh, could go evangelize my work in a way that I was not used to. Um, as someone who does not have any knowledge of the fine art world, business world, or anything like that, you just play baseball. Uh, I saw crypto art as an opportunity to um, do things my own way, in, in, in a sense. And so uh, uh, did that, released Sovereignty, uh, which was an important piece uh, in my evolution as an artist in uh, November of 2020, uh, one NFT art, artist of the year from that piece. Uh, 2021, uh, February, released Aku, which is a character uh, based around my paintings uh, after a, a young boy asked if Axe could be black. Um, and then, you know, uh, from there, just been building out Aku as um, a character and, and learning along the way uh, while still, you know, refining my fine art practice because um, I still do charcoal works and, and, and I really am a medium agnostic. And so uh, that's my quick two, two minute backstory right there. Wow, you dove right into Aku, which is one Perfect. thing that we definitely wanted to talk to you uh, a little bit about today. And and Micah, you are referring to it as crypto art, which is interesting. And many of our listeners know we've had many discussions around this because artists, you know, collectors refer to this in different ways. Is it NFTs? Is it digital art? Is it crypto art? Um, so I love that you're, you w went straight in with crypto art. And I think it seems like the genesis of Aku kind of started from your more traditional art world, but is really manifested through um, your digital art and your crypto art. Can you tell us a little bit about like that development process of developing the character of Aku and, and how um, Aku has, has shown up to date? I noticed you're wearing the hat, by the way. So oh, I made this. <laughs> My wife made this, actually. We, we, nice. Uh, we're blue collar folks, man. We do it. We make stuff for ourselves. So basically my paintings, um, I released them in 2020 with, with Art Angels. My first show, I did some shows before that, Dodger Stadium and Woodruff's Art Center in Atlanta. Uh, but this is my first show as like a real artist, a uh, solo artist uh, in uh, 2020. And I was painting kids in uh, astronaut helmets. That became a symbol of uh, um, unattainable dreams, seemingly unattainable dreams, right? How many astronauts do we know collectively? Not very many, but they exist, right? And so that helmet became a symbol. Well, these paintings, they're one of ones. They are expensive. They necessarily don't reach... Uh, the audience that I was really trying to reach, which was kids and, 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 you know, wider audience of people we all dream. And so these paintings would hang on people's walls and it's one of one. So I saw Aku as an opportunity to, to expand that message more broadly and, 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 and in a more scalable way that could reach the proper demographic, uh, not knowing anything about distribution of characters or develop, development of characters. Uh, I released him as an uh, animated series in, in 2021 video series um, on Nifty Gateway because that's the only way I knew how to distribute uh, my creativity. So that's how I saw and how I see um, Web3 in a sense is like this is an opportunity. This is a distribution channel uh, for an artist to be autonomous uh, who may not understand the, the ecosystems of uh, Hollywood or books or, or anything like that. For our audience, I mean, I, I think I first noticed... Micah's work because I would often in 2020 and early 2021 20, go into these digital art galleries that people set up on everywhere from like crypto voxels and there's like kind of all of these really interesting digital Shout spaces. out crypto voxels. I bet you haven't been there recently. I've not been there recently. Um, and I would always see 
in like very high end collectors that they would have, you know, one of these images of a young black kid in a space helmet. And it always felt so evocative and so kind of dramatic. Um, and then I noticed you had started doing these animations. Uh, I think I own eight of your of the 10 uh, of those original animations um, as well. I was always a big fan of the work that you were doing. But what I also love is that every one of them t tells a story was part of this journey. And I also thought you were utilizing a toolkit that we weren't seeing very much in the, the crypto space, which is you were doing like kind of very high end emotional uh, mm -hmm. animations where most people are doing, you know, animal photos or they're doing traditional like static artworks. So I thought that that was something that re was really special. It really felt like you were making these mini movies. I'm just wondering, you know, you've been in four years now. You've really gone through like the entire span of the, of this this ecosystem as it's been growing. I would love to hear some of the battle stories. What were the challenges? What were the successes? How did you recognize that this was uh, a really positive moment for you as an artist? So um, that's great, man. Thank you. Thank you for your support. I really appreciate that. Um, the thing I've recognized and where I'm coming at right now is I'm I'm, I'm very clear headed right now, understanding who I am how I should show up in the world, what am I best suited at? And so the, the, the battle scars are uh, over the past four years is there's times when you do things or I've done things that you may think you need to do. You follow the path of maybe somebody else, right? You're like, okay, well, this is the thing that people are doing. And you have a lot of, you have a lot of opinions, right? Whether that be from the outside world, you know, hey, you should build a company this way. You should build the brand this way. From community members, hey, you we need to do this. This project's doing that. And so a lot of my scars, or not scars, or just l lessons that I've learned, hard lessons I've learned, was there's been times where it's been really hard. I would say the past couple of years for me uh, and Aku has been hard because I fell into, I fell into this, this world of like not necessarily doing what I wanted to do or what I love to do or what, what I was best suited at. And... That's easy to do in, in Web3 because it is such a open dialogue with so many different people. It's an always on ecosystem. As somebody who, who likes and, and prefers to work alone in the grungiest of places, the best ideas I've ever had, there was nobody around, right? It was always just me in a grungy, you look, you can see the space I'm in. I'm not in pretty places. It's the, the work. And so... I would say that's been the hardest lesson and I'm very grateful where I'm at now in my process, knowing exactly what I'm doing, exactly what I need to do and, t and, and being grateful for the past couple of years of struggles. And because I, if I didn't go through those struggles, I would probably be building something that I wasn't that passionate about. And we'd go years down this journey of like, I'm not that passionate about this and it doesn't work. I think in life, you have to do the thing that's authentic to you that's going to work. Like it's going to work all the time. It might not be some massive scalable multi-billion dollar company, but, but you, you can say, okay, after those years of working on this, it worked. Right. And so that's where I met right now. And that's the biggest, you know, that was the biggest lesson I've had to go through over the past couple of years is just blocking out the noise and trusting in what got me here. And, you know, in baseball, they always said, like, I got to the major leagues and I didn't really I was always this top prospect coming up, right? I was balling out in, in minor leagues, right? And I got to the major leagues and I changed my game, right? I started becoming, started taking a lot of advice. And, it, and when you get to the big leagues, they always tell you, do what got you here. Like, do what got you. So they always tell you. And I never really applied that. I, I, that's why I'm, you know, 2018, I was out and in painting in my garage, right? And I'm taking that lesson now. I'm like, no, actually, I'm going to do what got me here. And that's just creating things that are authentic to me. Um, and, and putting those out for people and not worrying about the audience's reception of them. Just the audience is like the last thing I worry about. The first thing I worry about is putting out a quality product or a quality piece of art that can hopefully inspire somebody. I love that. I feel like you just got like very real because a lot of like Web3 founders who had a lot of success, including yourself, of course, like you've sold eight figures of digital crypto art, maybe more. I don't know. You probably know the exact number, but You've had tremendous success in that space. And, you know, that comes with um, major opportunities and also major challenges. Um, and, you know, you're you're touching on the fact that community members or the NFT holders are a really vocal group. And sometimes that can be like really hard for founders and creators um, because ultimately, you know, their interests are oftentimes very financial and your interests might be, of course, finances are a part of it, but it's also art. It's about the story you're telling. It's about the brand you're building. Um, and it seems like you've evolved this sort of uh, where Aku is going continues to expand. I know you were just at the um, NBA All-Star game and you had a really cool activation there. 
Um, it looked amazing on social yeah. media. I, I also love NBA All Star. I feel like it's actually like a very underappreciated moment um, in culture. Can you tell us a little bit about sort of how you got there, the brand you partnered with, and, and how that all came together? Yeah. Um, so I'm from Indianapolis, hometown, like something near and dear to my heart. Um, and so NBA All Star being in Indianapolis, I wanted to do something there. The reality was over the last two years, um, I really haven't created anything. I haven't put anything out. I was managing teams and trying to scale a company. And, and, and now I'm like this guy that's now in a position of having to uh, think about like building a business, right? So towards the later part of last year, like, no, I'm not going to create. Because as an artist, when you create, opportunities come. Conversations can be had. There's things to talk about. We hop on in my podcast last year. If we hop on a podcast last year, there's nothing really to talk about. I'm not creating. But now we're talking about NBA All-Star. You see? So, so NBA All-Star was like, yo, this is my moment to come back and say, look, I'm putting out quality work. Uh, and, and my model is really, and when, when it, what, what my model going into it was, I wanted to create a really cool art experience, bring people together who don't really necessarily go see fine art. So I wanted to create a dope experience, but I also wanted to leave the city better than I found it. I wanted to create an impact. And so what I did was created a, uh, an experience of art. So I created the studio. My buddy uh, had this amazing studio space that he had to take a, a freight elevator to. And I decked it all out and, and made it mine, grinded on that. Wife designed it, ripped the carpet up. It was not something. We did it, right? And, and so I showed my, my flat works there, canvas works, and then the new Aku sculpture there. That was amazing because now people came on Friday night and then they came throughout the weekend. So I was bringing people into the studio all weekend long. And they were hanging out there for a while, you know? So we were having these one-on-one -on -one conversations amongst art. Then we did the Aku basketball court. So we renovated that. So we partnered with the Hoop Bus, amazing organization, amazing people, where they really, truly, authentically believe that basketball can make the world a better place. You know, the whole motto was show indie love. So we renovated this court. So I designed this basketball court, Aku, uh, at Northwest uh, Middle School now. And it's, a, uh, it's an underserved, underserved community but there's kids from all over the world, all over the world. So, you know, English is like the, the last language spoken there. And so we created this court, this international court, and that's permanent there. And we did a bunch of activations on the court, three on three tournaments, dunk contests. Even the dunk contest winner, Matt McClung, we were judging a dunk contest on, on, after the day after the morning after he won the dunk contest. It was an amazing thing. Um, and then we did the Aku bus. The Aku bus was traveling around the city all weekend long. Um, so I designed that. And, you know, kids can come shoot hoops on the bus. And it was just all over the city, all over the state, honestly. And so it was art, social impact, and community. And those three things are like what I saw, what I wanted, what I wanted to do was prove a model that I could do this again and again and again in different cities. How do you bring people together with art? And then how do you create social impact and leave the city wherever you're showing or displaying or exhibiting better than you found it? And so that's what we did in Indianapolis. And it was a very small team, very, very small team. We were sleeping on an air mattress, a couple of nights sleeping on the floor, like very small team. And that what like it, it was the best, one of the best experiences I've, I've had in, in years, quite honest with you. And Mike, I think one thing that, that has always been inspiring for me is, and you've been doing this for years now, but yes, you have this art project and the art is the genesis of it. But I think you've always thought a little bit about or probably a lot about how Aku is a brand and it's a brand for inspiration, right? So people wear the gear. We've seen, you know, folks who like, their kids end up making a cardboard helmet like to, to replicate it. I think you've always thought about it through the lens of how can this be digestible and kind of, you know, ownable from the youth, right? Like their ability to sort of see themselves in it. I'm just wondering, you know, that that way of thinking, because the, the All-Star game is such a good example of now we can put all these kids through this experience where maybe some of them start to think I can do this too. That's right. So just, you know, just wondering your thought process about around creating a work of art versus creating kind of a brand. So great question. And so, there was a stagnant point within the brand over the past two years when we were trying to do things, right? Doing like business building things, right? Like there's some tons of amazing examples in the Web3 space of projects that are building incredible businesses. Pudgy Penguins is one of them, right? Where they have, you know, this incredible business, right? But what's authentic to me is building a grassroots brand, a grassroots business around uh, being in the community, being present, you know, showing up on the ground. It might not be the prettiest thing, you know what I mean? It might not be the most flashy thing, but it compounds, right? Like 
Like now kids, you know, we, you know handing out the backpacks. Last year we handed out 5,000 Aku backpacks, right? There's 5,000 kids now who know about Aku, who are aware of Aku, right? And ultimately my end goal is to, to hustle grassroots style, you know what I'm saying? And then when it's time, when we have the story out and we have distribution for the story, which we do, it's coming, everybody's going to be ready, right? And they're going to be like, you know what? I want to support this brand because this dude's been out here hustling. He's coming to see us, spending, spending time with us, getting, you know, it's not just, you know, that's just how I, that's authentic to me. And so that's how I think about building a business and a brand around uh, Aku is like people resonate with it. Um, it doesn't need to be some massive thing, just like going to a school. If I'm flying to, I was, you know, it's going to LA. I spoke to a lot of schools, right? That's grassroots efforts. Now these kids, the book comes out or a movie comes out or whatever comes out, they're going to be excited to see it. I know that guy, you know, I can be that guy because I spoke to that guy. That's the most important thing. It's like, I want kids to be like, I can be that dude because I talked to him. He was pretty normal. He's only 5'11", some say six foot, but <laughs> I can be him. That's the whole point. Yeah, it's really interesting to hear you talk about, you know, what got you here and sort of the lessons that you learned in baseball, sort of applying to your career as an artist and building these grassroots um, efforts and initiatives that engage different communities. Do you have sort of like a community in, like, in mind that you're looking to activate and you're looking to inspire? You talked a little bit about um, sort of the, the original inspiration of a uh, young black kid wondering if he can be an astronaut. Do you target like a sort of underserved communities or is it, it far and wide, whatever strikes your fancy? It's far and wide, to be quite honest with you, because NFT projects are a luxury brand. They are, they are, not, they are not inexpensive products, right? So you're a luxury brand. And so as a fine artist, I'm also a luxury creator of things. A painting is cost, you know, are five figures. These sculptures are expensive. So you are a luxury brand. But what I think is actually exciting about this new thing is I'm not overthinking the target demographic because my community is not full of all black people who feel like their dreams are limited. My community is people from Brazil, Singapore, United States, like it's a wide spectrum. And so even when I talk to companies or things, I don't try to like fit into their mold and say, hey, my target demographic is this. When this, the story has a target demographic, a thousand percent, the story is very specific on the age range because that's they know what to do there but for me as a creator i just cr want to create things that feel good to me and if the the market dictates what the price of my paintings are or the sculptures are you know there is a demand at that price point and that's what it is but in the future there will be a shift there will be accessible products for kids and how i'm serving kids in the meantime is by being doing the grassroots initiatives and saying hey like aku is a brand and I'm going to show up and we got backpacks and we got AR coloring books and we got colored pencils and AR coloring books. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it's really cool. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we gave those away in the backpack. And so kids can color in the lines and use their phone and and they can see the page turn to their colors and animate. And so we have these things. But but my strength is not producing toy lines or uh, kids products at mass. That's not my, my my strength. My strength is creating great things that people like across mediums do that long enough and now here comes the story then you then that gets that now the storm starts to hit so michael we talked a little bit about aku and you know the journey that you're on with aku and the character development there do you have another story in mind is there something kind of percolating in the back that you're like maybe this will sort of come up i know you are a multimedia artist and you probably have different characters that are in your mind um any any sneak peeks into what those might be yeah so i'll say what i could say for the past Years for years now, we've been trying to crack the Aku story, right? Like we like, could I build a brand without a story and have it be a symbol? For sure, I think I can. I think I for sure can. So the elements of creating this story were very difficult because you didn't want to make him hyper a hyper specific kid, and and people say, okay, that's Aku now. I don't know if I can be Aku because he acts this way. That was a major challenge with developing the story, and so the story is done. Uh, we finished that. And it's not just like, it's not just a story. It's a franchise. We built a world. And so that's done. And there's characters in there that I'm incredibly excited about, like extremely excited about that I think have- Multiple characters that we're going to yeah, get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's, it's not, um, how do I say this? Like humbly, it's not a 
This isn't like just we're going to put something out just to put something out. Because when you're trying to put something out in mass, they don't care about how like your audience size. They don't care like uh, how cool a character looks. The story matters. Like there's <laughs> this isn't I'm getting, you know, it matters. There's no they're not going to put their name on something and hope it's like the stories is what matters. So, yes, there's characters that I'm incredibly excited about. Furthermore, like what I'm also excited about is exploring the ability to pr get these characters in the hands of the community. Right. Aku's we never opened up commercial rights or things for Aku because that's my baby. That's the thing that, you know, I will do for, until I die. Right. But there's characters within this franchise that I think have equally as much potential as Aku has. And what I'm and we've been building this platform for almost eight months now that I think is is revolutionary when it comes to distribution of characters. And I'm hoping, to, you know, we're going to release it at the right time. But I think that opportunity to put characters into the hands of the community and let them grow alongside what we're doing with Aku in the story is very, very compelling because we've never really seen. You might have an entity like um, Nickelodeon or Disney release digital collectibles. But that's, those are IPs that already are out there in the world. Those are digital collectibles. What does it mean to grow alongside an IP when you put the power into the hands of the community? And so that's what uh, we've been kind of building towards when we think about how we stay tethered to the, the Web3 ecosystems. So it's more the Avengers than Wolverine is what I'm hearing. Yeah. yeah, um, yeah. Which is pretty sure. exciting. Um, Michael, my final question for you is, I think, just like a bit of a deep one, which is the re reality that still within the NFT ecosystem, most of the successful NFT artists seem to all look the same. They tend to be primarily white. They seem to be primarily male. And you are one of the few people, I think, who truly has broken through to say, no, like this matters. Um, and that you as a creative and a, and a business mind, as well as a world building mind, um, are valid and need to be held in that same regard, right? But there aren't that many people like you in that. How do we allow the opportunity for more artists who who have these perspectives to show up in a bigger, sort of more impactful way? And how much of it is just the fact that a lot of crypto is built on these kind of nerdy white kids who are just trying to like, you know, gamble back and forth and trying to make, you know, and any any money off alpha that they can. How do you sort of combat that? Mm, that's a good question. I don't think the NFT, and I know people, I've seen tweets when people post a picture of a party and it's like, oh, these are all white kids and, you know, and all that. But the reality is it's not different than the rest of the world. Like, it's not different than, if you look at the numbers in the fine art world and institutions and how many black artists are in there, you look at uh, how many black director, directors are in Hollywood and, and, and then you say how many black directors and how many black producers there are and then how many black leads there are. The numbers are, are, are mind-blowing at how skewed they are so my perspective is this is no different the black creatives have a different measuring stick that we have to measure up to than than white creators and it's very very rare for uh any black creator to break through i still have a measuring stick no matter what i've done you can look at the accolades and i'm still having to do things at another level at another notch and i think naturally too what happens is as black as a black creator, I can speak for myself, is like you do get a sense of um, shyness or humbleness about you. That's that's like a natural thing that you learn because uh, you don't want to ruffle any feathers. You got to stay in the mold. You got to stay in the lane. That's what you kind of like taught to do. And 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 I fit in that for a while. I was like, I don't want to ruffle the feather. I got to play in the in the safe safe space because the opportunities. I don't know if they're gonna come again. And so when I think about the NFT space, it's like sometimes it's not, it's just, it's, it's, it's not different than the rest of the world. It's not an outsized difference. It is the world. It it's is just a mirror to what would happen in the traditional world, to happen in a boardroom, et cetera. It's um, exactly right. It's a mirror. It's a mirror. And so how do you combat that? It's like now you're talking about how do we combat that across all industries. And, and, and what I think that is, it's what that looks like for me is like, People in a position of power need to start to look at the black creators and say, they, okay, black creators are driving culture. They are generating an insane amount of revenue for businesses, for companies, right? They're making things cool. So maybe we should probably start to put money behind them, right? Maybe we should start. Putting, and I've been very grateful that to work with some incredible brands and incredible leaders in the space that have done that for me. But I'm not, I'm, not the, I'm not the stamp of cool. There's plenty of other artists. I think that's where they got to look to and say, 
I, I'm going to put my backing behind this emerging artist because I like his message and I like his his art. He might not have 100,000 followers or he might not be tweeting all day how he's the hottest thing on planet Earth and that we're going to be the biggest artist. He's, but like, it takes one brand, one person to power to believe in one black artist and that could change his entire trajectory. It gives him the confidence that he never really had before, she never really had before. That is the thing that we need to do, right? Yeah. I, it's not coming come from me. It's going to come from a, a, a brand or person, a, a, pers a white person in power to say that. I had people that did that for me. Keith Grossman is an example of that. Jimmy, Jimmy uh, Eath is an example of that, who said, I, I like this guy's art. I like his message. I'm going to put behind that. And now that's going to, I think that's just the, the thing that needs to happen, um, quite honestly. I love that. And I also think you are pretty cool, my guy. And you've got a big influence <laughs> yourself. So I know you're, you know, out there inspiring kids one backpack at a time, inspiring collectors. Um, inspiring a lot of us and a lot of our thank Gen you. Z listeners. So thank you so much for joining us today. No, I appreciate you guys, man. I really, I really enjoyed this.